voiceover is everywhere, and you hear it every day from radio. To TV. Watch the story, Wishbone. Snack time, Wishbone. Oh, perfect timing. To movies. Shall we play a game? To animation. See, you moronic mutants. No more turtles. Look again, Shredhead. Four, count them, four turtles. And so much more. I don't want to grow up, because maybe if I did, I couldn't be a Toys R Us kid. Welcome to episode 31. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at the world of voiceover, including movies, TV, animation, and more. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Did That Voice. Today, I am super excited to be bringing you an interview with Tony Winters. He's an actor, writer, producer, and co-stars in many, many shows, especially one coming out very soon called National Champions. We will talk about that soon, but Tony, welcome to the show. Thank you, Trent. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to have you and grab some of your valuable time so we can chat about you and about the career that you have in the entertainment industry. That's what I'm here for. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's dive right in. So the very first question I like to ask my my special guests when they come on the show, Tony, is tell me about little Tony Winters, the young boy that grew into the man he is today. And how did he become an actor? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the little boy, Tony Winters, uh, grew up in Detroit, Michigan. I guess I was always an artistic child. I, I could always draw better than any other kids in my class. I could draw. Well, in those days, I used to like to draw football uh, athletes, football players, baseball players, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, or or action or uh, superheroes. You know, I was into, you know, Spider-Man and Superman and all those kinds of things. Um, and I would get asked to to do um, bulletin boards, uh, create create uh, uh, bulletin boards in my school and in junior high school. I painted the class mural in in high school but i never i i guess i always wanted to be an actor but i just never it never seemed possible never seemed tangible thing growing up where where i did and and in the and in the time in which i did however i loved uh the movies you know everybody loves movies but i really loved movies and <laughs> i would most people walk away and think, you know, that was a great movie. I would walk away thinking, I want to be in that damn thing. <laughs> I want to be one of those guys, you know? Right. And and during the 70s, when I was coming up, you know, there was kind of a renaissance uh, in terms of uh, Black film and Black television. Uh, there was, you know, um, Good Times and The Jeffersons and uh, That's My Mama, all these wonderful sitcoms from of that era, San Francisco. Yeah. But at the same time, in, in, in the movies, it was the black exploitation era. It was Shaft, Superfly, you know, all these kinds of things. But during that time, there was a movie called Cooley High. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Star Glenn Turman and Lawrence Hilton Jacobs. And at the end, um, Glenn Turman, who played the character Preach, He's running off into the sunset, basically. And then there's a crawl, like American Graffiti, that tells you what happened to each of the characters Yeah, in the story. And it said, uh, Preach uh, ran off to Hollywood and became a successful screenwriter. I remember thinking, you can do that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's, that's impossible to leave. Because his that, that film was set in Chicago. Yeah. And, you know, and I was in, you know, Detroit, which isn't, you know, socioeconomically far different. Yeah. And I said, you know, that's, if I'm not belaboring this point, uh, between my junior and senior year in high school, my mother sent my younger brother and I and my older brother out to California to spend the summer with my dad in San Diego. Nice. And, and my aunt just showed us Southern California. Uh, you know, I saw the Pacific Ocean for the first time, palm trees, you know, clear blue skies. And she took us to Hollywood. And uh, we were driving up uh, one street in Hollywood called, uh, which I know now to be Gower, but back then I didn't know. We were driving right by Paramount Studios and up on the uh, marquee, I saw Happy Days, which was a huge sitcom at the time. <laughs> yeah. And I said, wow, this is, this is real. Then we took the Universal Studios tour and, uh, and I was mesmerized. 
you know, seeing an actual working studio for the first time. And, you know, I remember the, the, uh, the tram having to stop at a, at, at a certain time and everybody had to be quiet because they were shooting an episode of a show called Operation Petticoat. You wouldn't remember it, but. I was remember, short. was it a TV show or a movie? It was, it was both. It okay. was a movie from like, I think, believe the early 60s and they made a, a, a TV series out of it. I think Jamie Lee Curtis was was one of the stars. Okay. And they were shooting, and 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 suddenly in that moment, I kind of had this revelation. I said, "Oh wow, this is real." You know, I, you know, this is a place where people work, and you know, they buy houses and and live ordinary lives. And it it seemed it much like in Detroit, where we made movies, where we made cars and trucks and you know tires. Here they made TV shows, movies, and music, and that yeah. sort of thing. And I said, you know, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to come here after high school. It took six years, but I got here. <laughs> I've never left. <laughs> That's awesome. What a great story about, you know, discovering the magic of Hollywood and that, you know, anybody can pursue that dream. That's fantastic. I love yeah, it. Yeah. You know, believe me, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Because <laughs> I, I, a lot of people give me a lot of props and say, hey, you know, you stuck to your guns, you followed your dreams. And uh, there was just really nothing else I wanted to do. So I just kind of hung with it. Well, Tony, I think it's fantastic. I really love your story. Uh, It's a great origin story. And most stories are very unique and different because everyone's story of getting to Hollywood is very different. There is not Mm -hmm. one way to get there. Everyone has their own way and there's been a billion different stories. So it's fantastic to hear yours. And it's also great to know that you are a movie fan like me because I am a huge movie buff. Uh, So I actually had a question about movies. What are three movies that inspired you uh, as a young man or three TV shows even? Well, um, there's the aforementioned Cooley High. Okay. Um, There was The Sting with Robert Redford and, and Paul Newman. That's a classic. You know that That's a classic. Yeah. And and I and I, I was an old movie buff, so this is really hard. Uh, the Wizard of Oz. Oh wow, classic, very classic. The Wizard of Oz is probably my all-time favorite movie, and I've probably seen it more than I've ever seen any other film. Uh, Rebel Without a Cause. You know, uh, I wanted to be the Black James Dean. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, kind of a Lando Calrissian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, awesome. And I have to say, Casablanca is, I know these are kind of become cliche uh, favorites, but there's a reason they're cliche favorites because they are the best. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Casablanca is one of my favorites. My dad introduced me to that when I was younger and Disney used to have the great movie ride and had that great scene from uh, Humphrey Bogart and I uh, totally am blanking on her name talking there at the end with the airplane and the propeller blades starting up and you know it's just such classic lines from most of those oh, movies that you mentioned the so. most quotable movie <laughs> in the history of film yeah uh, <laughs> yeah Nazis wore gray you wore black uh, you yeah, know absolutely. it goes on and on yeah absolutely yeah. okay so what are three actors that inspired you to get into the industry I'd have to say Sidney Poitier, uh, first and foremost. Uh, I just, when I was a kid in Detroit, we had what was called the 430 movie. The 430 movie came on every day at 430. There there would sometimes be a week dedicated to certain actors. You know, it would be, you know, Paul Newman week. It would be, you know, uh, Betty Davis week. uh, And and there would be a Sidney Poitier week. And that's where I saw the defiant ones and, um, you know, and I just thought this, who is this cool black guy? Nobody, nobody else was black in the movies for the most part, <laughs> you know, but who is this cool collected black guy who was so damn dignified, you know? And then I saw in the heat of the night and they called me Mr. Tibbs and it, it just goes on and on. And I, I, and I, I got a chance to work with him. Wow. I got a chance to work with him many, year, many, many years later. Uh, in fact, it was about 30 years ago. I did a film called Sneakers with Robert Redford, and which was another full wow. circle moment. It was with Robert Redford, Sidney Poitier, Dan Aykroyd, River Phoenix, um, David Strathairn. Wow. Uh, anyway, it's a wonderful film. It, it, prior to National Champions, it was the crown jewel of, of, of my career. Uh, even though I only had one line in the movie, 
and, and I only worked on it for a week. It was it was just the best thing I'd ever done. And then working with alongside Sidney Poitier and getting the chance to sit down and talk with him. And, you know, a man that I grew up admiring, yeah. actually working with. So, yes, uh, Sidney inspired me as I grew older. Well, uh, I, I got to say Fred Williamson. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you know who he is. It sounds very familiar, but I'm not, I'm drawing a blank. Fred Williamson was probably the king of the black exploitation films of the 1970s. He did Hell Up in Harlem. You know, he did uh, Hammer. He did uh, Three the Hard Way. It was it was a slew of films. And I had it. I snuck into a movie theater and I met him <laughs> and he was so nice to me. And I, I even brought my my photo album full of clippings and photographs and he actually sat down and thumbed through it with me and talked to me about my my aspirations oh wow so, uh yeah he was and i ran it i saw him about a week ago at a premiere here in hollywood wow which was incredible and i reminded him <laughs> of that uh i reminded him of that of meeting me when i was like 18 or 19 years old anyway um uh i I'd, I'd say redford Redford, okay. you know, uh, being a romantic lead, he was he was the Brad Pitt of my youth. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> he was that guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, the way we were, the, as the aforementioned, the sting. And uh, so, you know, three days of the condor. And I always liked, uh, you know, the hot rock. I always liked heist films. I always like, you know, guys breaking into something and stealing something and yeah. getting away with it. You know, I love those kind of movies. And Redford was was the king of, of that genre. Yeah. So uh, he he definitely inspired me. And Cicely Tyson. That's Cicely awesome. Tyson delivered so many great performances, you know, when I was coming up, you know, the, the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, Sounder. And I, I could go on, but you, you <laughs> get the point. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for diving into the actors and movies that inspired you. Uh, you know, really, they can shape our lives in more ways than we realize. And as we get older, sometimes they really do become integral parts of our lives. So that's awesome. No doubt about it. <laughs> so we are going to talk about a couple of the projects you've worked on in the past. Uh, you had a reoccurring role uh, as Anthony on Daytime Soap, Days of Our Lives. What was it like getting to be a part of that long running show <laughs> that has a huge history and has had probably billions of actors on it? <laughs> It, it was interesting how that how that job came about. Um, a friend of mine suggested that I I start mailing back in these back in the in the eighties. We would mail you know pictures and resumes to yeah. all the different soaps. So uh, that's that's what I did. He said you got a great uh, look for soaps, and, and and they pick up on it. So I started mailing to all the soaps. I would do it like every couple of months. And uh, one, one day I got a call to audition for. Uh, an episode of Days of Our Lives as an orderly in the hospital, couple of lines kind of thing. Same time, I auditioned for an episode of Dynasty. Nice. Uh, yeah, and uh, and and anyway, I got I got I got a call from my agent, and they said you booked. Uh, they want you for Days of Our Lives. I said, okay, that's great. Twenty minutes later, I get a call to say, oh, guess what? They also want you for Dynasty. <laughs> this episode of Dynasty. Same day, shoots the same day, so I had to turn down. Uh, days of our lives the role of the orderly oh wow then they called my agent back and said well you know what we got three days for him as a bartender <laughs> because our regular guy is 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 leaving the show yeah so I went and did the three days and then they wrote me in for the next year oh wow so sometimes things can happen in, in a very roundabout way you know what I mean yeah that's how that's how that happened that was my first look into big time Hollywood you know what I mean yeah I, yeah and 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 having a recurring role, not having an audition to come back, and getting to know the, the the cast and the crew, and everybody knows you by first name, as opposed to coming in for one day and leaving, you know. Yeah. And um, I remember I got invited to the picnic. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, it was a restaurant called Shenanigans, which was where my character ran. My character ran this 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 little bar. Yeah. It's kind of like Bennigan's, that that kind of place. Yeah. And inevitably, the, the contract players would walk into them and say, hey, hey, Anthony, how's it going? I'd say, it's going fine. Now, what do you have? I'll have a cob salad and a, and a, and a beer. I said, coming right up. And I walk away, then the scene begins. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that was kind of it. But, yeah. uh, you know, we all start somewhere. And it gotta, was wonderful. 
Got to get your foot in the door somewhere. Absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> that was great, man. I love Days of Our Lives. Every once in a while, I still drop in to see what's happening in Salem. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome yeah. that you're able to still kind of drop in and, and see the old gang and kind of, you know, go back to the roots, as it were. <laughs> yeah. So another pro, uh, another show that you got to be a part of, it was a breakthrough role for you uh, as Ozzy Dunbar, Emmy on NBC's Long Running Hunter. What was it like to be a part of that show and to play that integral character for that time? It was, it was fantastic. First of all, it was my first recurring role on a primetime series. Yeah. And the show had been well established uh, at, uh, at, at that point. And uh, I remember the audition for, for that character. Uh, I don't remember the exact line, but the character had, he was, I was a medical examiner and I was informing Hunter and the rest of the uh, police brass as to what was affecting, what was causing all these deaths in, in, in a certain community. And I had to say the name pseudo paradox in D. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that in the, in the script. I was like, how the hell do you pronounce it? I remember I went to a pharmacist and I said, how do you pronounce this word? This is before Google and all that. Kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Those kinds of things. So I went to a pharmacy said that's pronounced pseudo sino paradox and D. So I remember I went to the audition and it, it rolled off my tongue just like it did just now. Yeah. And I, I could see the light in the eye of the casting director said, Oh, I got this. And, um, but it was, it was wonderful, man. I, I did, um, I forgot how many episodes I did, but, you know, working alongside Fred Dreyer, uh, we didn't become good friends. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's kind of a, a quiet, imposing, intimidating dude. Uh, but uh, I had a good time on that show. Charlie Hallahan was wonderful to work with and uh, Darlan Flugel. Stephanie Kramer had left the show by that point. So he had a couple of uh, other ladies kind of filling that that space. Yeah. But yeah, I enjoyed Hunter quite a bit. That's awesome to have gotten yeah. to act with so many other amazing talents and to uh, just be a part of that legacy is pretty amazing to have added to uh, the jewel in your crown. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt, man. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about your up and coming project. It is going to be releasing okay. this November 24th. It is called National Champions. And I know due to NDAs, you have to be careful what you say, but just tell us a little bit about that as much as you're able to. Um, National Champions. Um Stars J.K. Simmons, Academy Award winner J.K. Simmons, three-time Emmy Award winner Uzo Aduba, Stefan James, who is a brilliant young actor on the come up. In, in the film, uh, Stefan plays a college quarterback on the eve of the big game. I'll just call it the big game. And, um, and he organizes a strike amongst wow. the players. Yeah, for, for pay yeah. and respect. And uh, cause you know, a lot of these, these kids, man, they're, they're sacrificing their bodies, you know, and they walk away from the college, college sports with, with very little. And sometimes yeah. they sustain lifetime injuries. So anyway, uh, he ignites the strike. Uh, JK Simmons plays his coach who is very close to this kid. And I play one of the NCAA officials who's coming in to um, manage quell the situation. If you Nice. Will. Yeah, that's very cool. I mean, J.K. Simmons, man, uh, I love him in the Spider-Man franchise. Like he's done the cartoons, he's done the movies. And uh, wow, you've been able to act with some pretty amazing people throughout your career. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I'm a huge fan of J.K. Simmons. And when he when I remember I was seated at a uh, at a table in one scene and it was J.K. right there. Uh, David Keckner, who I'm sure, you know, was yeah. seated across from me. Uh, Dave Maldonado to my right, Jeffrey Donovan were behind him, Uzo Aduba across the room. And I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, it's taken me 35 years <laughs> <laughs> to be able to sit right next to an Oscar winner right. and a, and a, and a three-time Emmy winner and a, and a host of extremely talented guys. But I belong here. Absolutely. Place. I remember thinking, this is, this is the best script I've ever read. I'll go out on a limb. I'm going to tell you it's Oscar worthy. And that for me is, is um, substantiated by the fact that the studio is releasing it November 24th, yeah. you know, films that are released at that point in the year, you know, they are considered, you know, the best that the studios have to offer. So um, I think it's going to be right in the hunt in, during the award season. 
That's awesome. Well, hopefully yeah. we will get to see that as a nomination and as a winner uh, come that time of the year. <laughs> that would be wonderful. I mean, nobody will be looking for me, but uh, the other the other performers involved and in, in the director, Rick Roman Wah, man, that guy. Let me let me tell you something about him. I, I've never really had that burning desire to direct. First of all, I always thought the director has to be the smartest guy in the room. Right. I've really <laughs> felt like the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> but this guy, he knew everybody's character. He knew everybody's objective and 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 uh, place in the story. So if you had a question about you know your character and where where he's going, uh, he could answer it and make it simple for you to understand if but he would also turn on a dime and go talk to the lighting guy about the lenses or you know <laughs> uh the sound guy he it was the most amazing accomplished knowledgeable director i i had ever worked with he knew the story inside out and was very very passionate about it so rick roman wah man he is a beast that's amazing yeah. well you know I actually got a chance to direct in high school and, you know, kind of like mentioning the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm the smartest person in the room by far, <laughs> but the thing I do think is that we have a vision of how we want something to look and sound and feel. And that's what, you know, especially as a dyslexic, because I have a lot more difficulty with reading than I do visually seeing things like Steven Spielberg. And mm -hmm. so I think for me, like in the aspect of directing, you know how you want the lighting to look, or you don't like the glare or whatever's happening, or you want something to change or, you know, and then you just know the perspective you want each character to have because you learn that script and you learn everybody's parts. Like you're the reader of a book, but you're now like helping those characters in the book, like portray it on a screen. And so it's like, it gives you that opportunity to kind of say, this is how I would want to see the story play out and i think that's really fun because for a director it gives them the ability to use their imaginations and bring a story to life in the perspective of yes how the studio wants it but also from their perspective as a director so that's pretty amazing that's pretty yeah. awesome so i've got two final questions for you today tony oh, okay and we will wrap this interview up are you ready i am all right. The first one is, what is the advice you would give to an up and coming actor like yourself? Uh, maybe somebody who's been dreaming of Hollywood or hasn't quite yet had that dream, but uh, wants to pursue acting eventually. What would you tell them? I would tell them to complete their formal education. I would say uh, read often and voraciously. Uh, I would say get as much local experience as you can if you if you're growing up in you know in the midwest somewhere you know join your local theater company and uh begin to do theater because that's really you know the acid test for an actor and you you will find if you really like this profession you'll find if you truly but you know you'll find that you truly uh you'll learn the you'll learn the uh, language of the theater you'll learn the language of the craft you get a chance to you know so I say always get as much local experience as you can before venturing out to New York or, or LA. And that's another point that you don't have to be in New York or LA anymore. Uh, with the advent of the self-tape, especially, you know, post uh, pandemic, you know, I sit, I, and I'm in this room in my office and that backdrop right there. And I create self-tapes for auditions. Wow. That's what I do most of the day. And whereas I used to get in my car, drive to a studio, sit there in the waiting room, you know, wait for my name to be called. And I walk in a room and try to dazzle them. Now yeah. that's where I do the dazzling right in front of that <laughs> backdrop. It's amazing how things have changed. Yeah. Yeah. Our world has really changed. Not as much fun. I mean, doing it by myself, but, or with a, another actor on zoom, but yeah, I would say get as much local experience as you can, because that might be enough for you. You might, want to be just an actor in your hometown in your community and that's fine that's that's a beautiful way to experience this profession but then you that may not be enough for you and you may want you know the bright lights of hollywood or or you want to uh go off to new york and you know pound the pavement <laughs> that that would be your individual choice but uh yeah i'd say get as much experience as you can do as many classic plays as you can before uh coming out here 
That's fantastic advice. And I totally agree with it because when you do the stage, you have to have everything memorized. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when you're doing productions, uh, a lot of times, whether it's voiceover on screen, whatever, a lot of times you can have, you know, somebody feed you the lines, they do a short scene. So you just kind of work on them real quick. And then, you know, it's a lot different than when you have to have a whole production ready to go to be on stage uh, or even doing something where you're doing like motion capture where it's voiceover, but it's also a form of acting that requires the scripts to be memorized. So I think that's a fantastic set of advice for people who are yeah. looking at coming up into the industry of acting and like you said there are different levels everyone from the local theater to man i can't get enough and i gotta go to hollywood or broadway right. now but you know some people find that medium place or that that beginning place and that's just that's perfect for them and they they you don't need the bright lights of hollywood region. yeah you can just work your region now you know you can yeah. uh, you know work at a, a theater in Michigan and the next year you, you're working at a theater in Ohio and, and you still have, you know, a regular home. Yeah. Jeff Daniels, <laughs> Jeff Daniels, probably not the greatest example, but <laughs> Jeff Daniels lives in Michigan. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and he spends time with his family and his grandchildren. And then he goes off and, you know, for a couple of months and does a project, but he comes home and has a very normal life. And trust me, there's a lot to be said for having a regular life. Absolutely. It's that work life yeah. balance that some people may favor more over the, the, uh, the fame itself. <laughs> true that, true that. Well, Tony, the last question I have for you today is what is the legacy you want to leave behind? Oh, wow, man. You went deep. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, gosh, I hadn't really thought about legacy, but I like to think that, um, I helped to tell some, some, some really good stories and I helped to move African-American cinema forward. And I was a voice for the black community in Hollywood, a, a, a small voice, but a voice nonetheless. Hey, every voice counts. That's what I say, man. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, Tony, I, I can't thank you enough, man. This has been a great interview and I really appreciate your time today. Well, thank you, Mr. Larkin. And this has not been a lark. I've enjoyed it as well. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I can't resist. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, Tony, it has been an absolute honor and pleasure having you on the show today. Would you please give us a special closeout as we end today's episode? Hi, this is Tony Winters, and this is Who Did That Voice? Hey, everyone, and thanks so much for listening to today's episode of Who Did That Voice? If you enjoyed today's episode, please check us out online on all social media platforms at Who Did That Voice and on YouTube at Who Did That Voice 24. Also, remember to check out our website, whodidthatvoice.org. Again, that's www.whodidthatvoice.org. Thank you to all my listeners out there. I just wanted to say, if you want to partner with Who Did That Voice, just telling your friends and family about us is the best way to share the show with others. And or leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. The third and final way is by joining our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Who Did That Voice. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice.